चिराग सर वेलकम टू द के एस एन शो pirates were firing bullets in the air torturing captain maybe tomorrow only the company will pay money so just a matter of a day or two <laughs> we never thought it will take 7 months and 20 days i had lot of verbal abuses and in fact physical abuses as well and uh, at that time i didn't realize what is happening with me before entering the red sea or the gulf of aden we lost the engine so and like for the next 3 days we were drifting and it was near sokotra island so we had no awareness about a citadel at that time so immediately they opened there was a ak47 and they just put up on my forehead and they said come in one of the experienced pirate who was about i think 64 or 65 in height his name was sara they said cough nahi betho betho six of them who boarded the ship but when we reached garaka there were 50 more pirates who boarded the ship and they were looting guarding whatever and you know so they had these duties to guard the ship they raised a ransom for 15 million dollars we ensured that our ship returns back to salala and mm. for the next 7 days we worked tirelessly without any much sleep to ensure that the ship reaches at the safest place and what in return are we getting from the company that you have worked for the pirates welcome back to the ksn show in today's episode we have a guest from the marine fraternity who was captured by the somalian pirates for 8 months he's going to share the entire story of how he got captured till the date he was released lot of insights and it will make you question whether you want to join this profession or not let's dive straight into the episode because this one is going to give you goosebumps for sure Chirag sir welcome to the KSN show thank you for accepting this short notice which i sent you just day before and uh, we are honored to have you here how are you feeling today sir hi karan i think it's a pleasure of mine that i've been always dreaming of coming and meeting with you in person it's uh, so lovely to meet with you today and uh, it's an honor for us to be part of this show thank you very much for having us here thank you sir so sir um, i've been following your work for a while but uh, today i want to take you off work and today i want to get the real side of chirag sir who was uh, a first time uh, cadet and uh, let's start there sir how did your shipping journey start like uh, where did you do your pre c and everything let me go a bit of more back to that question then how i got into the merchant shipping altogether so i still remember that uh, after my class 12 i had an opportunity to do various things and on one side i had filled up some hotel management forms on one side some engineering colleges form on one side uh, uh, you know i was always fascinated in my early years somewhere around when i was in 9 10th 11th and all the classes that when i used to see some merchant navy ads i do not know what happened but i used to fascinate about that like, okay it's like a lucrative career and all that so after 12th i thought that uh, this i saw this ad from the tulani maritime institute in pune and uh because it was a private institute so they had a direct entries i thought maybe i can fill up a form and give it a try so i just tried it but what happened was they called me for an interview and uh and then i was in double mind whether i should go or not because i, I just <laughs> filled up the form to be very frank and i was not very sure whether i should join the merchant navy or i sh- because i had so many other opportunities i'm based in delhi and cr so i had lot of opportunities here and uh, this college was based in pune I was I was in double mind whether to leave my family and to go all the way to Pune to do this engineering, and uh, but somehow my grandmother and my sister they they backed me, my parents backed me, and uh, they said no you should definitely try, uh, this is a very good career. Uh, so but then again I saw I told my grandmother I still remember that okay I'll go to Pune to appear for this interview. but i would like to go to mumbai as well and uh, because i've never been to mumbai at that time it was always a dream for a youngster at that stage to go to mumbai and see the beautiful city all together and she said okay i'll allow you to go to mumbai and i'll pay you for your trip to mumbai but on the on the condition that you will also appear for this interview and you you will do your best mm-hmm. that's how the entire thing started right so for 
going to pune so, so for going to mumbai i visited pune first okay okay <laughs> <laughs> i got selected okay. there right, right. and uh, then i came to uh, jokes apart but i, I was actually interested in the merchant navy mm-hmm. and then i came uh, in the college we in, in the year 2000 i got admitted there and uh, started off my entire four years of career right uh, my training set uh, the tulani maritime institute so sir you were from the deck department or the engine department engine department so we okay. i completed my bs uh, marine engineering okay. from uh, tulani from tulani yes. okay sir so um, how were the tulani days sir you still remember them was it the best fabulous yeah. wonderful i think uh, a lovely time of my career because the first time this was the first time hmm. i was uh, able to go out completely from mm-hmm. my home and stay in a hostel Mm. The hostel life is absolutely mesmerizing. A lot of friends you make, a lot of different people you meet. So it was lovely mm. to you know uh, be there, and especially the weather of Pune, the the environment of Pune. Mm. Uh, uh, moving out from uh, a smaller town uh, where I was born and brought up of Modi Nagar, which is near to Meerut, mm. uh, and uh, going. to a fabulous city of pune and all that so it was i think a dream come true did you get directly placed into a shipping company yes yeah that was the at that at our time in 2000 when we were passing out in like in 2003 the company started coming in mm. actually some of the carriers used to have more jobs and we used to have lesser carriers to supply, uh, uh, provide them to the companies in fact okay so yes i uh, and uh, you know i appeared for two or three companies and one of them was chilaram shipping where i got selected okay. we were two of us who got selected in chilaram shipping okay and uh, and sen- that's how my journey started with the, i joined them uh, for the first time in my as a uh, trainee uh, engineer in the year 2003 okay. because i need to complete that six months of my uh, course uh, mm-hmm. on board ship and uh, what happened <laughs> over there was again a uh, 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 you know i you know obviously it was so exciting to go on board your first ship mm. and that was also for 3 to 4 months because that was the time period you were given to be on board and then you have to return back and complete your next semester mm. but when i went on board uh, before going on board i applied for my us visa it was uh, cancelled oh unfortunately and okay. i had a you know it was a big setback and i was uh, very upset about it and uh, because uh, cancellation of us visa means that you may not get a proper ship and all that and you might company might not take you mm. they might prefer a more uh, a cadet who has uh, you know visa. us visa but anyhow i i really appreciate chilaram shipping they gave me an opportunity to go on board ship which was in australia so they flew me out mm. to australia to join my first ship in mm. gladstone wow uh, i still remember the date i think it was uh, 8 of september 2004 2003 when i uh, you know So um, yeah, yeah so how was how was that feeling sir going uh, on board <laughs> after Tulani <laughs> uh, you I, I'll, I'll just let you know that on my first flight uh, that was again my first international flight out of India I had uh, and uh, my flight was by route by Singapore to Australia and in Singapore we used we had a 17 hours of transit oh you stayed 17 there. hours in the airport oh and I enjoyed every bit of that 17 yeah. hours <laughs> what did you do sir <laughs> <laughs> i didn't have the money so yeah, yeah, yeah. obviously uh, yeah. it was only very small amount of piece of money that i mm-hmm. had uh, but i exchanged it before i went on board mm-hmm. but i just used the internet and the free things which are there in the airport mm. to the maximum thing uh, but i really enjoyed that time mm. you know because right. it was the first time i was in uh, outside of india and all that Now you ask me seventy nine. I would say not even. <laughs> <laughs> I just search for flights which are having the least transit times. Absolutely, absolutely. So, but that was a lovely time. Uh, it was very exciting thing. And when I when I landed in uh, Brisbane, and then after that the third flight was to uh, Gladstone. Hmm. The, in, after reaching Gladstone, we were extremely tired from the last two days. We had I didn't had a proper sleep at hmm. all. Hmm. But then still I was very active. Okay. Very the fresh excitement. Very of joining. excitement was on top of that, and mm. then the agent took us first to his office. That the ship is delayed; it's going to come in the evening. So we were sitting mm. in the agent's office for about four hours again. Oh, and but then I was able to roam around in the Australian sh- streets. Mm. I said, okay, mm. let me go out because it was so excitement of mm. you know moving around. That was uh, I think somewhere I was I was acting very excited to see different places and all that. So mm. we just roam around here and there, and then by the evening, agent asked us to okay. the ship is getting alongside we need mm. to go mm. we started and then i saw the ship berthed in front of me mm. it was a big uh, bulk carrier mm. 
and uh, Panamax size and I, I really saw that I said wow I will be going on board sh- this ship there was a different feeling altogether mm. came at, after seeing the, the first ship of my like you know right. career so yeah so we boarded by you know uh, praying to God that everything goes okay from there I went on board yeah that's how it started all were you homesick during this 17 hours layover not exactly I was yeah. exactly I was like having a lot of uh, as I said I was yes. extremely excited mm. After reaching on board, after a mm. few days, absolutely, after a few uh, yeah. couple of days, absolutely, I started. Yeah, you feel that homesickness. Homesickness things came up, comes up. Yeah. Because uh, again, uh, the internets and the phones were not so easy at that time. It used to be mm. extremely expensive, and mm. uh, obviously, I come from a very middle ground uh, uh, family, and we didn't had the opportunity to afford so much of uh, phone calls that I can make to my family so I just informed my family I took a card from the captain mm. but I, I ensured that I used that card for the entire of my mm. tenure mm. of three months so yeah. the single card so <laughs> I just had to give a call to my family that I'm on board now and uh, that's it so just inform them on the phone for one or two minutes and that's right, it sir. but so then yeah. to make the next call I had to wait for a few days okay so it was <laughs> that that time when that the internet was felt, not there also yeah. So, sir, uh, how was it when you entered the engine room of the ship for the first time? Right. What was it like, the big scary. machinery? Absolutely scary. Is it? Because you had so much of voice. One thing is scary is the first thing. But then, wow, what is it? I'm going to be working. How will I get to know all these things? There were so many questions going on in, the, in, in your mind at that time. That how are you going to be, uh, you know, there's full of challenges ahead of you. And how will like, you master those challenges? Mm. Uh, to grasp the skill and uh, how will you learn it y- yes there were so many excitements but mm. on the other side there was a lot of fear that will I be able to d- deliver it mm. so there was a mixed feelings of, of that nature at that moment mm. but obviously uh, after seeing such a and as I said it was a Panamax uh, bulk carrier so it was a uh, you know six cylinder engines were there and was quite big I don't remember exactly the size but uh, I, I really I, I haven't seen that kind of ships before so I think it was uh, lovely it was different feeling altogether yeah you never felt like go- the deck side is better <laughs> N- I think deck engine sides are always good I've never yeah. ever I had any complaints of my engine I, I love my career for that part mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. I, I think yes that uh, there are plus and minus for every part of the things but mm. uh, it's all about what interests you more mm. right, uh, uh. where you can get you know, things, uh, what ha- makes you happier more. I right. think that's where you need to then look into. So, sir, during this cadet ship, the first one, uh, did you have some um, encounters, per, like particular encounters where you felt, oh no, why did I join this profession? What? Many. Yeah? Many. Many? <laughs> I've not disclosed till now, but no, I think please. this is our show today. Yes. On my first ship itself, uh, by one of my seniors, uh, Obviously, I was extremely slow. Maybe I, I'm not, I was not fully prepared on what to do and all that. And I had a lot of verbal abuses and, in fact, physical abuses as well when I went on. And uh, at that time, I didn't realize what is happening with me and why it is happening and all that. And I thought that because I need to deliver it. Because as I said, I had, I had taken an education loan and everything. And then I need to ensure that I can't complain about it as mm-hmm. well. So it it added on my problems as well because mm. I had I didn't share with anyone what's happening and there was a lot of pressure for on me uh, to learn everything very quickly and all that stuff so that that was a bit of and that's where I was every evening I used to find people on mm. board where I can sit and talk mm. Mm. but I could not find many people out there mm. because you know I didn't knew anyone yeah, it's a new it's a new world mind. altogether. I don't know whom I can share my feelings and my what's going on in me. Mm. I can't call my family mm. for everything because I don't want to dis- make them you know unhappy. That mm. it's my just five seven days, ten days has happened, or a week has happened, or one month has happened, and I'm just started mm. you know complaining. On the other side, I don't know whom to rely on, mm. where I can share those things. So I think that was a bit mm. of disturbance for me that happened in the first initial uh, thing. Yeah. The, the the best thing what happened, or you can say the bad thing or the best thing for both things, mm-hmm. I would say, after 45 days of sailing from Australia, we came to Brussels in Belgium, mm-hmm. and uh, we offloaded the cargo in Brussels, and I think to Tunisuan in Holland. Mm-hmm. And from there, the orders came that the vessel has to go to US. 
Oh, so and I didn't have the US visa. Right. So I had to sign off from the vessel. Oh. On one side, yeah, I was happy that I'm I will be away from this ship where I was extremely traumatized because of the uh, seniors behavior towards me. Uh, but at the second time, I was extremely unhappy because I was I actually cried uh, at that time because I didn't want it to go. And uh, luckily, my master, he consoled me, he said, don't worry, this is uh, not the end of the world. You will get a next ship and all that. So it was a very difficult time for me to understand that how will my career you know, because I've done, I've done only 45 days of my internship. Mm. Now, which company will prefer me to again go back? Because I, I need to go back to the college in the next yes. couple of months time mm. for the classes. Mm. So I don't have any more time left mm. to rejoin any ship. Mm. And will that impact my entire, uh, you know, course and all that? So it was extremely difficult time for me to correlate myself or where I'm right now and what is happening in my life. So I, I was clueless. Hmm. So uh, after after going back to the uh, after going back to home. Yeah. So uh, what were your thoughts like? What did you share with your family? What happened on board or you just let it be? No, I I moved on from there because when I came back, I went to straight away to the college. And uh, I reported to the college, I mentioned, I, I didn't share much of the thing, but I just shared that I've come back and then they asked me to, okay, I reported to the office, I reported, uh, and then I went back to my home because the company told me that you better go back home, we'll let you know if there is any opportunity for us to, mm. you know, take you back on board ship. Mm. Uh, so I went back home, but obviously I was extremely tensed mm. for the next few weeks. Right. Luckily... Again, my company gave me a call on one day that we are again placing you. And the com and the, even the institute supported it. He said, they said, that's fine if he can come even one or two months later in wow. the semester. We'll be more than happy if he's on board. So I think that that's how it worked on. The company supported and the institute supported me mm. to carry on my career. And they gave me a second ship of my semester. I think I was the alone seafarer yeah. who got two ships in their internship. <laughs> Right, right. So it's a blessing also. It was a started. blessing. And there on that, I did three months. Mm. And every and that second ship was amazing. Yeah. All the people were... So what I want to say that there could be one or two people on mm. board who may not like you or who may have a different viewpoint and all that. But shipping is such a wider thing that I find most of the people are extremely helpful, mm. you know, supportive and all that. So this second ship was extremely, you know, productive for me. Mm. I learned a lot of new things over there. The people were really helpful. Uh, and uh, I did three months. So my seniors used to say, we have come here for six months. How can you come here for three months? Mm. So they used, to, they used to have a joke that you are the super you know, sailing on board or what? Super on board. Super on board. So one ship you do 45 days, other ship you do three months. So we have never done that in our career. So right. I'm lucky that I got that company right. to back me. Right. So, sir, you know, last night I was Googling um, Chirag Bhari. Oh, sure. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's the primary reason also, sir, which I wanted to bring you here for. The first uh, news clip, it says that seafarers stuck in Somalia for eight months. So uh, I want you to guide us through it. Why I'm asking you? Because even my parents are watching this. And uh, of course, there's a fear factor of piracy and everything. Uh, it's an honor first that you are here to share this. And we are very uh, uh, fortunate to be uh, to have you here. Can you run us through some what happened uh, with you, sir? So I'll, I'll go, uh, I'll start off with 2009. In 2009, I was on a, chemi on a product carrier and uh, the vessel was heading to, from Singapore uh, via the Red Sea into the, in, uh, we were heading towards uh, uh, Istanbul to discharge the cargo. But before entering the Red Sea or the Gulf of Aden, the deck side decided that we will do the engine, you know, rehearsals and we will just make sure that our engines can maneuver well and all that stuff. Unfortunately, in that process of, you know, trying it out, we lost the engine. Okay. So and like for the next three days, we were drifting and it was near Sokotra Island. Like the deadliest the place. The deadliest place. 
and that we and then finally the engine room team was you know we had because on when you are on board you will not get anybody in the middle of the ocean you won't get any support you have to do things on your own so we did all that whatever we can do for the, after the third day we managed to run the engines at a very slow space and uh, we make sure that we reached to the next port which was uh, oman we drifted off to oman and then from there the engines repaired and then we continued our journey this was in 2009 but that and why i'm telling you that incident was that because this incident then gave me a lot of courage that we drifted near sokotra islands nothing happened to me no pirates have come to me so mm. these are all stories i think this these all things happens with some ships who are managed by poor owners or you know bad owners or something and this won't happen to us so you know that thought came as in my mind i'm just telling about my mind yes sir so the next ship in 2010 i joined this uh, ship uh, called marida margaret and uh, uh, i joined in vietnam it came to india to and then it was not exactly scheduled to go into the red sea uh, or the gulf of aden but it was uh, sh- actually scheduled f- to go back to the southeast asia but then somehow the charter changed at the last minute and now the thing came that the vessel is going to be in europe mm. by the gulf of aden mm. i was the first seafarer on board and the first officer on board who wrote a letter to the company that i will be signing off from the ship because you had that inclination uh, because uh, i thought it's, it's not worth of taking a risk uh, is it at that time the piracy was uh, what really high speak what as it peak 2009 10 onwards it was as it peak mm-hmm. and uh, i decided and after see uh, a lot of other crew members also approached me being an officer that sir can you please write a letter for us as well so i drafted a mm. <laughs> letter for all of them and i gave them whoever wants to write their choice mm. right we have n- we are not the one who have to decide for them it's up to them however some of them you know didn't sign that papers because of mm. several reasons that they felt that uh, by signing off the company might deduct their wages they will not get an, another opportunity mm-hmm. there are a lot of financial issues at home and they want to continue with that and other things mm. at the last minute company has <laughs> decided to promote me on board okay so then i thought because i was looking for this promotion from long time and i thought on one side i'm getting a promotion <laughs> <laughs> so catch on one you. side i have to sign off i said it's just a matter of 4 days mm. last ship again i bring the 2009 incident last ship i i drifted here for 3 days nothing happened somehow let's pray to god and let's you know things yep. will be okay this time as well mm. let's take this promotion so i i i stayed back on ship <laughs> wow so but what a situation <laughs> yeah what a so situation. but we but what happened was on the on the day of 8th of may 2010 that's when the incident happened so in the early morning hours i was finishing off my shift and uh, uh i just came back reached back to my cabin and uh, the call again came from the engine room team the next because we were doing six on six off stuff so the engine room team said no oh, there is a uh, call from the bridge that we have to increase the speed and there are suspicious things happening so all the engineers are asked to come down so I immediately pushed down to my engine room so between 5 to 4 to 6 7 i was we were there in engine room for a couple of hours a lot of things happened because we had to stand by the third generator as well we ran the generator we were extremely doing everything whatever they were doing harsh maneuvering the deck side and all of that things happened and for a couple of hours we were extremely worried what is happening because uh, in the engine room you can't know what's happening on the on top right and we can't keep them calling the deck side what's happening but we have to just keep calm at that time so it was that a couple of hours passed 6 o'clock or 6:30 we got a call again from the bridge side that you know things are okay and let's resume it normal so we are on our course now nobody is there behind us so we went back i went back to my cabin for my hmm. you know um, Uh, my rest and all that and then uh, i booked my rain rain again at 11ish and uh, i went to the bridge at that time i wanted to call, give a call to my family because i was due to make a call i, I could not do it at that time because the phone was busy and all that mm. so i saw the captain there and i just asked him this question that's uh, you saw that uh, we were approaching what has happened and uh, you know 
uh, what happened in the morning this is somebody was suspicious was approaching us but they after a couple of hours they went away okay. you think it's a fishing boat but i asked have you approached any navies uh, for that or law enforcement agencies he said no we have not reported it now this one of the senior another deck officer was there on the bridge that time I, and i just asked him you know are we prepared enough to handle this situation do you know what you have to do in case of this thing he said i'll call the captain mm. the thing is that we were not fully prepared at that time we had no trainings we had no awareness drills we had no briefings mm. uh when in 2010 right know? right so that was a lot of drawback out there mm. in the afternoon the same afternoon again i was in engine room with my uh, uh rating uh my support team and uh, again we got a call and uh, pirates chased us and within 20 minutes they boarded the vessel now this time because it was it was right in the day time all the crew members who were taking rest they mustered on the bridge because it was a lunch time on you know, just after lunch time so people were in and out here and there and they somebody said oh somebody is approaching so all the nobody knew that they don't have to go to the bridge there is a citadel there's what do you mean by citadel this was the first time i heard the word citadel in my life when i was in captivity so we had no awareness about a citadel at that time so there were some gaps out there and there was no security guard team also on board because the company said we can't spend so much of money in hiring a security guard team so we didn't had even security guard team so it it because the entire crew were on the bridge and nobody knew what to do some people were saying let's make hard starboard hard starboard other said other any of any rating or any crew said let's move no no they are coming from the deck uh, hard starboard side let's do it hard port so you know people were just giving instructions just like that and there was no not a management proper management of the things were happening and what happened because of that we lost all the speed what we had right we at, and the load on the engines became so higher that we were about to shut, shut down. down and i have to cancel all the uh, we, it was a right in the hot weather may yeah it's always hot there 34 yeah. 35 degrees sea water and the extreme temperatures of the exhaust and everything water temperatures were going on we had to cancel all the limits and no one in the engine room was there apart from me and my support team uh, support member so we were two over running up and down after 25 30 minutes i got a call from the bridge and saying that you have to come on bridge uh, and uh, immediately and it was a very rushed call kind of stuff and uh, i i thought they are just you know pulling my leg because i just asked them some questions in the afternoon <laughs> so they are trying to pull me pull my leg so i said nothing has happened we'll just wait we'll just stay here uh after 5 minutes again it was a bit of screamy kind of why the hell you have not come here just come they are asking they are getting very terrified you know something as what has happened and then me and my support member we started from the engine room and uh, we went up as soon as I, we were reaching the bridge uh, the final stairs the five stairs were there final from the accommodation side inside the accommodation and we were hearing some voices coming in from inside the bridge oh obviously the door was locked from inside the bridge to uh, the accommodation door of the bridge and uh, my crew member said sir let's go and hide somewhere in the bilges i took a step back i said let's go but then immediately i do not know what struck or something and i said no but let's wait if we if they're going to find us somewhere they might shoot us they might see us suspects or something it's better we go and see we be pa- be part of it and then i think whatever things will happen it will happen to everyone not mm. alone to two of us So let's see let's face it what have happened and as soon as i knocked the door of the bridge immediately they opened and that time there was a ak47 and they just they just put up on my temple like on my forehead and they said amen and i was like that moment i was i got extremely shocked because i was like i don't know what has happened after that for the next few couple of minutes i had no idea what had happened after that how i went inside like what were the steps i took and where i did went and, but after 2 minutes i realized that i'm now inside the bridge so uh, like 
at that moment uh, nothing came in your mind uh, like you were totally it was totally blank blank totally shocked and blank and i had no and still i can't remember what happened for me for the next one or two minutes i was extremely it was like i never thought of that thing and again i didn't i came to know that it was ak47 only during my captivity i had never seen an ak47 what do you mean by ak47 how how does it look like but i saw only a person holding a gun on me and then suddenly i saw when i realized everything i saw i'm sitting on my hands up and i was sitting on my knees and but right in the front of all the seafarers who were sitting at the back side and then i started accusing myself i was the one who signed the i drafted the paper <laughs> so signed of letter for the first time i uh, what will happen to my family what will i do and all of that you know i started accusing myself and then i thought i'm in the right in the front so i will be the first one today to go so i started just remembering the final things of you know uh so for the next few minutes it was extremely terrifying to be very frank and because the, these pirates were firing bullets in the air uh, under bridge wings just to scare us they were torturing captain to maneuver the ship towards somalia a lot of that and they were making a lot of noises and and after about 15 20 minutes i started seeing them what does the pirate look like after seeing so many movies and lot of that yeah. is this the pirate look like no i never saw i never imagined this would be the, because yeah, they were they were wearing hawaii chappals they were wearing a lungi okay and a vest is it like this captain <laughs> phillips movie which we see which we have seen yeah, like yeah you've seen that so they are mostly like that but Uh, yeah so but at the same time you you have never thought of the pirates would look like that are they like like they are to kill like their eyes and their body language was they are they will show all their violence obviously because they want to keep you calm and they under their control mm. and uh, but their intention is not to harm you we had no idea about that as i said yeah. we had we don't know because we were fearing for our own life mm. that today is the end of the things Mm. But after an hour, one of the pirates, because there were six of them who attacked us. Okay. And a uh, couple of them, among them, are senior pirates. Okay. That means they have done. They, this was their third or fourth hijacking, successful okay. hijacking. Okay. A couple of them were trainees, who were doing for the first time. So they were mixed batch of things. So this is how their military college also works. You know, the pirate college. Oh. They, and how this uh, thing works in Somalia. they will come with a batch of inexperienced and experienced ones and so one of the experienced pirate who was about i think 64 or 65 in height his name was farah <laughs> i still remember those things and so uh he came and because somali arabic and hindi they have common words okay so some of the somalis they speak arabic as well as arabic and hindi they have common words so they said khauf nahi baitho baitho Oh. so that was the first statement what he made still you know i can echo that in my ears i just uh, relaxed that that time i just relaxed that at least they are not going to kill me today no today i'm saying right tomorrow i don't know but today at least he's not his intention is not to kill me then he started explaining because he can't speak hindi or english mm. or anything he said company money to shush go go home and we thought oh maybe tomorrow only the company will pay money and we will maybe it's a, just a matter of a day or two <laughs> we never thought it will take 7 months and 20 days <laughs> in total so that's how the journey started we moved on from somalia we reached garakad oh, okay so the ship was diverted, diverted. maneuvered by maneuvered. Cap- the captain yeah, yeah, of the yeah. ship and yeah it was diverted we were all on oh. the bridge wing continuously continuously yeah yeah no bathroom or any no we, we were just like we the, we were using the washroom but it was all also in the lot of this controlled ways right that one pirate will just stand outside the toilet and within one minute you have to come out of the toilet mm. and uh, if you don't come out they will ha- harass you more and in the same night they started looting away everything like they, the ship took, uh, the sh- like everything what we had money you know, and everything yeah they took one by one each of us to the cabins and uh, you know stole away everything what we had even undergarments and then we were looking at it are these really pirates like who are they like you can't imagine they are wearing one t-shirt two t-shirt three t-shirts on top of whatever they are wearing 
whatever jacket they are getting, they're just they're ensuring that whatever they can get, they can just wear it and take it away. So anyhow, that thing went on for the entire couple of next days. So and whatever, and we had left nothing actually. Luckily, we had a couple of our clothes in the engine room, so we were able to use it. But most of the people, we our all luggage bags, laptops, or you know expensive things are all everything was gone. Uh, they asked us to submit their mobile phones. We did that and everything. But unfortunately, one or two seafarers they hide their mobile phones, oh. which is the wrong practice to do again. There are reports from my other stories, other cases which I have handled that some people have resisted to give away because they asked me my gold ring or uh, some of the other stuff, uh, jackets, expensive jackets and all that. Some people resisted to give. Mm. What will happen is they're going to be just thrash you mm. and they will take away. So the uh, the thing is that the learning point is that you give away whatever, you know, you can purchase your all this um, essential or whatever the items are there yep. whichever you lost again but you won't be able to get your life back mm, right right sir. so so you diverted the course and you went to which place Kha- garakad garakad where is it is it garakad is in somalia yes in somalia yeah. so the ship there's was there's a town okay. uh, there's a small uh, village uh, and uh, so the ship was anchored 3 miles off garakad okay and the local village so you know what happens is that the pirates in the new process they will negotiate with different uh, the pirates group will negotiate with different villages. Where do are they going to anchor the ship? Because that they need the support of the local village oh. to supply things, to make the pirates move up and down and all that. So they will they will do the internal negotiations over there. So okay. because we halted in a couple of places in between. Okay. Uh, before we finally anchored in Garakad, where they rested us for the next eight months. Okay, so you dropped the anchor. Yeah. Then they took you by boats? No, no, we were there on ship. You were there that on was the, the best ship. part of that happened with us. We were okay. there on ship because the ship is the safest place on in Somalia. Mm. The There's always a civil war going on inside Somalia. Mm. These pirates, for them, ship is like a seven star Hot. safer places where they... Because on, on land, either they will be killed by somebody, some other group, mm. or the second thing, they might die because of hunger or... Right. Famine or any other stuff or other, you know, health issues. So, sir, eight months on the ship anchored in Somalia, how did you get food, water? What was happening, sir? So, the first few days were like trying to adapt to the new things, what is happening. Because What, what was the schedule like, sir? So, we were in the engine room, like engine department. So, you know, we had to run our machinery, the generators and everything. Mm-hmm. So, we had to do six on and six off kind of stuff. So... The next very day mm. of our hijacking, mm. one of the crew members, he came to me and he said, here's my sign off letter, resignation mm. letter and a sign off you and you accept it. I said, what the hell is that? Because right now you're in captivity and none. No, no, I'm just giving to you that tomorrow if insurance, if I die, the insurance will be doubled to me. I don't know what that logic was. You know, people started behaving very differently when... So that was the one thing which we were extremely worried about because one by one, a lot of group people started, you know, uh, digressing or uh, digressing from their main thing that we have to stay united and we have to work together. Hmm. So the engineering team also only the two engineers and two motormen were the one who were doing the six on six of rest. Others were either they said no, we won't be doing anything, hmm. or some of were not not allowed. Okay. To go inside the engine room. So what rank were you at that time? I was in second assistant engineer. Okay. Time. Yeah. And what happened was that initial days were, as I said, was okay. We had water, we had fuel, uh, we had food for one or two months to survive. But then the problem started because we never thought that, you know, it will take so long because mm-hmm. every time we were thinking oh, the negotiations will start and things will happen and all of that. But the negotiations started only after 15 days. Okay. So uh, 15 days, there was no negotiations. The company was not even had a word with the, the pirates. The first call the pirates made was after 15 days of hijacking. Oh. That so, so the company didn't know what's happened with no, the ship? No. And we and we were also not able to tell anyone. So we were extremely worried what will hap- my family will be doing in this these days. Right. What will be, you know, where are what will be happening to them? Mm. How will I reach out to them that I am safe, I am alive? Mm. They may not know mm. all these things. So it might be extremely worrying situation for us mm. as well. But 
after 15 days they they took that time to evaluate what is the cost of the cargo mm-hmm. what is the background of the owner and everything and so they evaluate everything and they put up money of they raise a uh, uh, ransom for 15 million dollars for the release of the vessel okay and we thought okay 15 million company will give and get us home whatever i know it's a big amount but then yeah but we had no idea that the negotiations will start only with just a fraction of from 15 million oh and when the first offer came from the company i don't exactly remember the figures but it was not even 1 million it was less than that and said and we were like shocked yeah. we had we were like how the hell can company can do this yeah because uh, why can't the company just pay them and yeah. later on we realized because after that i've been part of this all of these things and we realized this, these are all very really protracted negotiations wherein you put in some figures and then you have a counter figure and these keeps on going on until less and until you are able to break the morale and uh, and the mindset of the pirates that there is no more money left for the owner to give you this happens in piracy right it's yeah. not a no- like a normal deal which happens when you go and buy or sell your car or your house mm-hmm. or something you agree for something maybe 5 to 10% up and down you do and you are then you know on your own right sir. so so that thing took time so the food after yeah. two months so the food we were exhausting because we and then the, obviously the cook was able to do some rationing of the food mm. he saw that maybe we just only 15 20 days of food is left so he started rationing things mm. earlier we were able to make he used to make dal and a uh, uh, vegetable for everybody mm. now then he started making only a dal and rice and kind mm. of stuff when he saw that rice is also getting depleted when he saw the dal is also getting depleted or uh, that there's not much in the store then we started after two months with the only the uh, indian breads okay uh, we had some you know flour in a, uh, in the thing so we used that as well even that started you know depleting after a few days and weeks so pirates used to get sometimes uh half boiled rice from a shore okay they used to so they used so to they used to get the boat? boats they used to have boats so that's how the role of the village is very important the 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 village will supply all the you know rations and the food and the support systems and the logistics oh. so that village will protect the ship okay from any other intrusion see the pirates are not afraid of the crew members now because mm-hmm. they know that pirate the we are there we are in yeah. their territory and we yeah. don't have guns and you know and just to let you know also that we were six of them who boarded the ship but mm-hmm. when we reached garaka there are 50 more pirates who boarded the ship uh, so we uh, were 50 50 50 50 pirates on the were, ship were on the ship and they were looting guarding whatever and you know so they had these duties to guard the ship my god <laughs> oh i i mean so right now honestly uh, i'm i'm like in a very different zone because being a seafarer yeah is trying to relate to it is already a very scary thing for me yeah. but sir <laughs> so how was it when you reached back india sir what so what was it so we arrived at home uh, unfortunately when i arrived at the airport uh, at that time i came to know that i have lost my mother during my captivity period i didn't knew that and uh, obviously i i was yeah. extremely shocked after that and uh, uh at one stage i was thinking that i should have not come home only to hear this because at that time till that time i didn't knew my family was also hiding because at this time when i was released and returning home then my family didn't disclose anything so about my mother so yeah so but then uh, yeah the life moves on things happen uh, slowly and slowly i was obviously at a very set back stage a lot of other things happen in my personal life i don't know what to do some people even my friends some of shippy friends were saying you had you know you got about 8 months of free salary so you have become extremely rich how was how was the food on board is there any taj hotel in somalia you used to get food mm. so a lot of that you know even our fellow seafarers uh have not shown any empathy or you know sympathy on putting up things together and then some people you know just try to label you down mm. you you have like you won't be able to do anything now and i thought no again my family was very supportive of that it is whatever you want to go back again we will go back you can go back but ensure that you don't go again in that route mm. 
and I said, I need to prove it to myself that I'm fit and fine. I don't need to prove to someone else, but mm. I need to prove it to myself that I'm fit and fine. I, I can again go back. I've, I, you know, nothing has happened to me. So many people have said, oh, this has happened, this has happened, your life is ruined and this and that. I said, okay, let me give it a try. Mm. So I got an opportunity with a shipping company to uh, work for two months. I went there. I cleared my class once at that time. Um, I got back into my own feet because I was not able to car drive a car or to move anything. My my neck was extremely frozen and uh, my back was extremely in pain. I used to, when I used to sleep at night, I, I used to scream every day of pain. Uh, that trauma, it went on for another six months. But it took me six months after coming home to come out of that pain, actually. And uh, finally, uh, we were not we were not given full wages, full due commitments. The wages came, but the commitments and some other help things were financial support was not given by the company or any other stuff. And uh, there were some seafarers also that uh, the especially the deck crew uh, and the engine the engine crew and the galley crew who did extra work in the because we were doing continuously right. six, six on and six off during the right. eight months. So as a officer in charge of the engine room, I asked the company to pay them at least. Uh, their uh, extra, you know, work time. Mm. You don't want to compensate anyone, that's fine. You just pay them that figures. We were not getting any responses from the company at all. So after two months of that, we again moved back to Mumbai, again with the help of ITF. We did a lot of, you know, they supported us a lot in that process. We came to the company and we arranged a call, con call with the German office. And one of the senior representatives from the German office, he told me on the phone, and they were about nine of my other colleagues, we all came together to the office and I was leading them, being the senior officer there. He told to me, I said, sir, at least give the money to the there's four crew members, two of the engine room and two of the galley department. They have worked tirelessly and, you know, we are asking you about four hours each day. Mm. Um, whatever is the, as per their contracts, whatever the fixed, uh, the uh, bonus, uh, the extra hours overtime, payment is there, right? overtime money is there. It used to be, I think, not more than four or five thousand each dollars. So he said, listen, you have not worked for me. You have worked for the pirates. Go and ask the pirates to pay you money. Oh. I still remember that words. And that kept on changing my course of my thinking in my mind. What's happening? Like, why are we treated like that? We ensured that our ship returns back to Salala. We ensure that it should not be towed by the engine by the company because it's going to be extremely expensive, expensive for the company to tow away such a big ship to the nearest port. We did everything we, after even after seven eight months of captivity, even our, with our so much of poor mental health and physical health, we ensured that we worked again on the engines, main engines as well as the uh, uh, generators to ensure that they run. And mm. for the next seven days, we worked tire tirelessly without any much sleep to ensure that the ship reaches at the safest place because we love our work. Love, work is like our mother Pretty and we sure. give her respect. And what in return are we getting from the company that you have worked for the pirates? Oh. So that was something which hit me very hard. And yeah. I thought that we need to do something more for the other seafarers that they should not face right. all these challenges of losing a beloved family member during this entire thing, not getting a proper support, during the time you're in captivity, your family do not know what to do. Seafarers do not know before joining a ship what they, how they need to be prepared mm. uh, before joining a ship. So all these things were getting in my mind. And mm. that's how, you know, I, I ended up <laughs> in MPHRP uh, in 2012 when I started, uh, when I started working for them. So, so uh, you went back to sail. Yes. For two months. Oh, yes. How was that? <laughs> so I, I mean, I, 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 it's hard to even imagine. <laughs> But so how? What happened? Brilliant. Superb. The crew was extremely supportive. Obviously, I didn't have to share too many stories in that because I just wanted to uh, maintain that, you know, uh, my professional work out there and all that. Obviously, my chief engineer knew it and, uh, you know, and uh, uh, the company knew it and all that. But I don't have to share too many things with anyone. But as a whole, it was a supportive crew. I, I enjoyed my last career, uh, last sale of my life, in fact, till now. <laughs> so I so think so. That you, was in, yeah. you proved yourself right, sir. 
yeah I, i like i'm in a very heavy zone right now because you know being a seafarer being the podcaster right now you have transported me to a zone which has got me into a lot of reflections to be very and so first of all thank you so much for sharing this with a very open heart and i i, I don't even know how to conclude this podcast because sir, i have so many questions right now <laughs> but i think i myself has gone have gone into a very deep zone so uh, so thank you thank you so much An honor for us to be part of this show thank you very much for having us here thank you sir so that was chirag sir explaining the entire story of what happened with the somalian pirates huge inspiration for me because you could understand from his story that this man proved himself right that he could go back at sea even after this deadly encounter and it gave me a spark that yes this profession is dangerous but there are a lot of learnings which no other professions can teach you so do let me know in the comment section what was your favorite learning from this episode and also mention the person who you know who is faced a similar situation in the marine field and we'll try to get him on the show thank you again stay tuned for the next episode signing off ksn